Let's try it one more time. Good evening. Good That's much better. Um, I, I want to first say how excited I am and we are as Peace and Justice Studies Association to have this conference, to have it here in Pennsylvania, and to have a topic that's near and dear to many of our hearts, revolutionary nonviolence in violent times, 50 years since 1968. I'm going to say a couple of very brief words of greeting, then introduce another greeter, our co-sponsoring and co-hosting organization, and then we're going to go with the plenary that will open this weekend's activity. In looking at this work and looking at defining and redefining revolution and nonviolence, I try very hard not to quote too many white men from the US. I do that in part because there's a wealth of information, experience, and lessons that I think those of us in the North, including academics, maybe sometimes especially academics, need to learn from the peoples of the Global South, who in many ways have looked at this question much deeper and with much greater degree of struggle than we have. But I'm going to break that rule just a little bit tonight by saying this uh, about two icons of that phrase from 50 years ago, David Gellinger and Barbara Deming, and especially about their mentor from some decades before that, A.J. Musty. Now, some of you know that I also represent and I'm the national co-chair of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and I was a chair decades before that of the War Resisters League. I'm honored to have been only the second person since A.J. Musty to hold the top position in both of those historic nonviolent organizations. And Musty, in the late 60s, spoke about his younger generation students, mentees, Dellinger, Deming, and others. And he said a quote that he was hearing from them way back 50 years ago that I think is as relevant today as it was then. He said that Dellinger and Deming kept reminding him that if we don't talk about nonviolence in revolutionary ways, if we don't talk about revolutionary change and total systemic, institutional, structural changes in all of the isms of society, patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, homophobia, etc. If we're not looking at those issues, if we're not looking at systemic, total transformation, total revolutionary change, then in fact, we're perpetuating structural violence. That unless we talk about nonviolence in revolutionary ways, we're perpetuating structural violence. And that in fact, those gaps, those issues, even when we're done with the best of intentions or maybe with a certain moment of not really thinking or working or acting as deeply as we need to, is something then, and I would say now more than ever, we can no longer do. So I think for many of us struggling to define and redefine revolution and nonviolence, this weekend provides a very special series of opportunities. I'm going to introduce our co-hosting organization and its secretary general, and then after her I'll say a few words about the speakers and we'll be off and running. It's a great honor to have as our sponsor and co-sponsoring organization the National American Friends Service Committee, which is really, as we know, the International American Friends Service Committee. And it's a special honor to have not only many key AFSC representatives here this weekend, a plenary we'll have in a few days, a pre-conference workshop we had today, but also the International Secretary General here with us to open tonight. She is a teacher who spent many years uh, in her, is it native Ramallah? Yes. In her native Ramallah in Palestine. 
uh, and, and just fairly recently was promoted within the network to the Secretary General of AFSC. For all of their incredible work over many decades, work that they've won a few notations for, including the Nobel Peace Prize, but also uh, for all of her work uh, as a Palestinian human rights activist and as the new leader of AFSC, please help me in giving a warm welcome to Joyce Ajlani. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Wow. And you pronounced my name very well. That's great. That's a plus for you. <laughs> Good evening, friends. Um, I, um, I want to thank uh, the conference organizers for the invite. Uh, I've read a lot, uh, some about Arcadia and the PGSA uh, program, and uh, I want to congratulate you for uh, this excellent, exemplary programs that you run. AFSC has benefited firsthand uh, as two of our present staff, actually one is a fellow right there, he's your alum, Sarav is here with us, and so uh, they have truly uh, done a remarkable job and set the bar real high for Arcadia, so congratulations. Um, now, I, reviewing the, the program, uh, what I found, I found a lot of compelling things, of course, in the conference this week, and the richness of the topics and the notable lineup of panelists and speakers, but, but more so uh, in bringing activists, educators, and researchers together in the same space. I, I have seen really remarkable results when these three pieces align together. And so uh, it, is, it is really no doubt that uh, this conference is going to be a great su success, I, I am sure. Um, when I read the panel topic for tonight, I thought, hmm, as a Palestinian who has lived under military occupation for the majority of my life, as an American, as a Quaker, a former educator, an international development practitioner, as an activist, and more recently an executive with this incredible peace and social justice organization, boy, do I have a lot to say about revolution, nonviolence, and armed struggle. <laughs> but I was, however, told I need to be brief and address tonight just to sort of welcome you all and say a few things about um, what I think about this, this great work. So, um, so let me briefly talk about why I became an activist. It really wasn't by choice. A Palestinian or any other person, as a matter of fact, who lives under an oppressive regime, a brutal military occupation, becomes by definition an activist. I did not know I can refer to myself as such when I was, along with my people, resisting military occupation and oppression and fighting for our dignity and for freedom. I never woke up one day or one morning and said, hmm, this occupation is upsetting me. Let me see what I could do about it. It doesn't work like that. Because when people are oppressed, they are activists at heart. They know no other way of living other than resisting resiliently. I didn't know I was an activist when I demonstrated against occupation as a child, or when, as a teacher, I held clandestine classes in my home for my neighborhood high school kids during the first intifada when Israel closed down all schools for months on end. I also didn't know I was an activist when I defied the 24-hour curfews imposed by the military commander and insisted on driving to Jerusalem for work. Or when I lied to the soldiers at the checkpoints and pretended to be a Michiganian American with a heavy Midwest accent. Can't seem to perfect that anymore. <laughs> And the list goes on and on. But throughout, I have subjected myself, my family, sometimes when, when, we, when I, when I um, basically smuggled my children in, at dawn during the Second Intifada out of the country through hills and, and through, um, it's, it's, it's through check or, or ditches, I should say, 
uh, and took hours and hours to get out of the country to Jordan, risking our lives, really. But, you know, knowing the risks and the consequences, you, you go on. When, when, you are, when you are coping and you are intervening and you are resisting on a daily basis, when you are insisting on your social and political rights and on equality and e dignity, your activism becomes internalized and a matter of survival. You know no other way of living. So, entire populations with their steadfast existence remaining on their land against all odds are all resistors and are all, therefore, activists. So I'm, I'm a third generation Quaker. Long story on how that happened uh, to a Palestinian, but it has to do with my peculiar grandmother. Mm. But maybe that story we'll save for next time. But with that, <laughs> uh, we'll see, okay. we'll see. But with that, opportunities for service opened the way for an exciting career in leading two remarkable Quaker institutions. The Ramallah Friends School, I led that for 13 years, and now the American Friends Service Committee. I was drawn to the AFSC because I saw that it clearly had a soul. Living in the US, especially these past two years, like many of you, I couldn't help but recognize the intersectionality of the global injustices taking center stage. All of them brought back clear parallels from my life and work experiences in Palestine. The incarcerated, the oppressed, the and the vulnerable globally, the refugees, the internally displaced, the immigrants, the people of color, the LGBTQ communities and Muslims, I felt a real connection. Thus, my commitment to social justice work. Today, organizations like AFSC are getting results. And from, I've been with AFSC for one year only, and I've been traveling a lot and visiting projects and programs all over the world and in the US. And in my mind, I have a list of why this work works. I want to start with the most important one. The most important one is that we, we do this work not alone. We do it with our allies and with our m movement builders and coalitions, and that's why we succeed. Another reason is because this, we do courageous work. We push the envelope. Israel put us on its list of banned organizations, yeah? That's because we're, you know, we're being provocative, you know, and principled about what we do. We don't, we don't stop there. We work in North Korea, for heaven's sake. So, we have, we have gained the trust of our partners. And, and, and that does not come by chance. Organizations gain trust when certain things come to place. One, we don't do hit and run work. We don't say we have some money, let's go spend it here and get out. In the communities we've been, be it in the US or internationally, we've been there for the long haul. We have built relationships, real true relationships for years, decades. And with that came that trust in the community. Another thing is that when we work with communities and we work with the impacted, we, didn't, we don't work for them, we work with them. And they are at our side. And a big part of our decision making comes from them. And so we, we draw our leadings from them. When I, look, when I visited our immigration programs or our uh, work in prisons, I was in awe that our staff are actually the immigrants, the undocumented immigrants. I saw that our staff are actually the formerly incarcerated. In one of our projects, I asked about the program committee, and they said, oh, we don't meet like that around the table, because some of them are actually in prison, because they, are, they form that. And so, what a genuine way of getting community uh, uh, trust in, in, in that. You know, also the decolonization of our work globally. When I visited our programs in Africa, 
I realized that not one staff in, in the African continent was a non-African for AFSC. All our staff are from Africa. And the same for follows through for many of the regions where we work. So that to me is sort of some of the, the pillars of why an organization like AFSC is, works, works with results. You know, you know, another thing, and it doesn't sound like it now, but we do our work with humility and the quietness of, 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 uh, of Quaker diplomacy where we can bring together people from, that are not used to sitting on this table. And we do it quietly and we open the door for the different truths to come out. And I think, I saw that in Myanmar where the, the Buddhists and the, and the Rohingyas and other Muslims uh, are sitting together thinking about how they can support humanitarian efforts. And so, uh, so things like that. So I'm, I'm not gonna delve into more of what AFSC is doing, but, and it's not alone in this. And um, I'm just saying that these are elements for successful, um, peace and justice work around us. Um, you know, the US, like many other countries, is going through similar, uh, similar attempts of subjugation as corporations, power, and big money venture to take over the lives of ordinary people. I've traveled a lot and I've seen that, and I'm sure you have and, and, and you've been grappling with that. With so many ways that the current wor world violates human rights, excuses oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, and exploitation, restricts, restricts civil society space, even the work of activists like us is restricted, and uses bullying and force when dialogue would better serve. We have much work ahead of us. Yes, we have great challenges, <coughs> and these are bleak times indeed. But let us not lose sight or even of the even bleaker conditions in our history that we transcended because of our collective action and unwavering conviction. Lots of people are working in their communities and building up the basis of popular movements to make changes and continue civilizing their societies. These efforts have always been met with repression. What is happening today, not that it's different than other attempts, is just, it, it just, what is happening today, not that it is different than other attempts, it just takes a different form, is an attempt to destroy independent activism <coughs> by restricting civil society spaces and evoking fear taxes, the tactics. The administration thinks we enjoy too much democracy. We are posing a challenge to those who think they are running a corporation. They therefore feel they have to moderate this democracy and create a new status quo. Remind yourself that your work, this work that you all do, is making a difference. Studies have shown that authoritarianism and attempts to weaken democracy are crushed only when people stand up. History has taught us that we can attain incredible gains when we work together. From the American Indian activism to the civil rights, anti-war, black nationalist movements, women's LGBTQ rights, they all made substantive gains because of people like you, like us, coming together. While it looks pretty bleak on most days, keep positive. We need to exercise resilience, knowing that with collaborative partnership and the building of robust coalitions and movements, we will overcome. We must continue working together to address our shared problems with shared solutions, to think boldly and innovatively, and yes, revolutionary, to stand by each other and protect each other. By being here this weekend, <coughs> you are affirming that you are part of this movement. We are together making historical and monumental strides as those have done before us. Be empowered and inspired by them. I don't mean the leaders, although they are impressive folk, but be inspired by the masses who stood by them. Remember, 
It is the ordinary people, the students, the teachers, the organizers, and the researchers that make the leader emerge and take center stage and not the other way around. So it's all on us and we can do it. Good luck. Thank you. I'm going to very briefly introduce our three speakers in the order in which they're going to speak, um, and then we'll take some questions. Joyce, you can stay with us this whole evening? Yes. Excellent. Many people are, are able to stay for some parts of and some for all of the conference. Joyce cannot be with us uh, tomorrow, so I urge folks in the Q&A section to ask her some questions tonight, maybe about her grandma. <laughs> Bridges to the Future, Strategic Challenges for Movement Building. Oh, nope, sorry. That's tomorrow morning. <laughs> <clears throat> Stay tuned. Teaser. <laughs> A continuum. There we go. I'm on the right page now. Follow along with me. A continuum of perspectives on revolution, nonviolence, and armed struggle. Now, I am not going to read uh, these uh, speakers' short biographies because I believe you all have the ability to do that on your own, and those are in the program. But I'd like to say a few brief words about these three folks who I think uh, are very extraordinarily suited to kick us off. Uh, George Lakey, in addition to being a profound organizer, uh, an activist, is also a writer and a trainer, uh, and in some ways, in terms of this topic, the Manifesto for a Living Revolution, which he helped pen and which was a guiding point and revised several times by the Movement for New Society and many others, has been, for many of us, a fundamental text. It's excellent to have him start us off. Or Churchill, uh, who many of us know as a, a great scholar, both of uh, indigenous peoples, but also of the movements of repression, the classic works, the COINTELPRO papers, that in some ways lay a foundation for our understanding about repression as it was done back in those decades ago. But Ward is also the author of a small pamphlet that's grown larger, uh, called Pacifism as Pathology. It's in its 30th anniversary edition now, and we'll, Ward will be talking about some of those issues. And then finally, I'm particularly thrilled to introduce Wendy Elizabeth Marshall, who I have um, cutely titled the most important, but, but very seriously, it's hopefully cute, but also serious, the most important uh, academic thinker that you've never heard of because Wendy has done a profound amount of organizing and not enough writing about these dialectic spaces, these spaces we operate that are, well, I'm gonna use the phrase of an old AFSC mentor of mine. Many of you know one of my key mentors was Bill Sutherland, Pan-Africanist, who uh, was a part of AFSC staff and then was a, a key person recognized. And Bill spoke about working between the cracks that it's not so much this side or that side of things, but in some ways it's a tightrope walk that we do in our work. And in some ways I think Wendy personifies an understanding and analysis about walking between the cracks. So without further ado, and with lots of time that Swasti will introduce herself and carry us through in terms of Q&A, please help me in welcoming George and Ward and Wendy. Good evening. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Richard Dorman from the US Civil Rights Office came to the center of the stage to make the announcement. He looked upset. In the auditorium were 400 students, along with members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, and other training staff. We were on the campus of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, to train for 1964 
Freedom Summer, Freedom Mississippi Summer. This was the second week of training. The 400 in the first week were already distributed around Mississippi, opening freedom schools, doing voter registration among black people who had been disenfranchised. I was sitting in the second row of the auditorium along with others of the training staff. Dorman looked around, then stared at the paper he had placed on the rostrum. We've just received word that three of the Freedom Summer workers were killed together in Mississippi. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. Cheney was a SNCC field organizer. Goodman and Schwerner were student volunteers. I was stunned. Cheney, along with the other SNCC organizers, had been at high risk for months, I knew. But Goodman and Schwerner were here in our training last week. New volunteers, like the students sitting around me, and they were dead. I thought about the students around me in the auditorium. What are they imagining waits for them in Mississippi? How many of them will get on the buses bound for the northern suburban homes many of them came from? In the next few days, I watched the SNCC workers build an invincible container strong enough to hold the shock and grief and fear that rocked our training. Very few students went home. At the end of the training, most got on buses and headed for Mississippi. The power analysis behind Freedom Summer. SNCC's 1964 campaign turned out to be one of the boldest and most brilliant strategic moves of the entire civil rights movement, with lessons for today. Their primary target was the federal government, led by a Democratic administration highly reluctant to support racial integration in the South. SNCC thought the stakes were highest in Mississippi because it was the state most determined to keep all power in the hands of white people. Mississippi Project Coordinator Bob Moses reasoned that if close to a thousand mostly white young people from the North came to Mississippi to accompany the embattled SNCC workers, the sheer danger of their exposure would motivate their parents and communities in turn to force the administration to act. That part was bold, but not unprecedented. The year before, SCLC had had forced President Kennedy's hand by focusing direct action on Birmingham, Alabama, by spotlighting the terror that enforced segregation. This geographical maneuver of escalating somewhere else in order to command the attention of Washington was now being employed by SNCC. The second part of Moses' strategy was equally bold and as far as I know broke new strategic ground. I learned about it by asking him directly during the first week of the two-week training for Freedom Summer. From 1963 on, SNCC's Freedom Houses, quotes, in Mississippi, where the activists often lived, were surrounded by people who wanted SNCC workers dead and had an organized instrument for making that happen, the Ku Klux Klan. Local law enforcement was useless. Police were often KKK members. The state government of Mississippi declared SNCC to be its enemy. The federal government's Justice Department, run by President Kennedy's brother Robert, refrained from intervening, while a rogue FBI under J. Edgar Hoover actively worked to undermine the civil rights movement. My question to Bob Moses was, under these circumstances, how so many SNCC members managed to survive. He told me, it's because we don't have guns in our freedom houses and everyone knows it. Mm. I don't get it, I said. I don't see the mechanism. I don't see how that actually protects you. Maybe this story will help you understand, Bob said in his low key, patient tone of voice. He liked teaching math. I guess he was used to students not getting it. <laughs> I think, said he, this is the sort of thing that happens. 
A worker in a small town hardware store shows up at the store one morning all excited. He tells his boss, the owner, that the guys, meaning the local KKK, have decided to kill the SNCC workers and burn down their Freedom House on the outskirts of town. They plan to do it that night. His boss says, no, you're not doing that. The worker is stunned, knowing that his boss is active in the White Citizens Council and hates SNCC as much as he does. The boss goes on, you guys have no idea what the consequences would be. Mississippi already has enough economic trouble. Getting investment from the North is really tough. So you kill up a b bunch of the N-word, and it's all over television in the North, and Mississippi looks to the banks up there like an out-of-control shithole of an investment. That's no way to act. I'm not going to let you do it. I walked away from Bob, marveling at the political sophistication of the SNCC strategy. They were using their own vulnerability to force the middle and owning class white citizens council to control the working class KKK, which keeps themselves, the hated SNCC workers, alive. Moses had a remarkable strategic mind. He found a way to lean on one bad actor in order to manage another. Identity politics completely blocks this level of strategic thinking. It's just too simplistic. Of course, if SNCC had tried to defend itself violently in Mississippi, all bets were off. SNCC workers would simply be killed in what would be branded a series of shootouts with minimum consequences for KKK and maximum negative outcome for SNCC. It was SNCC's nonviolent discipline and people knowing about it, that saved SNCC, that protected them. Moses' mind strayed outside easy polarizations. They're either for us or against us. To look for leverage in what seemed like an impossible situation. That leverage, of course, made it possible to pull off the move in relation to the Kennedy brothers. No more Northern volunteers were killed that summer, and Mississippi's segregation landed squarely on the agenda of the nation's power elite. And some of you will remember back the, toward the end of 64 summer, Atlantic City, the big Democratic <coughs> convention, the pain in the neck that the Democratic, uh, uh, free Democratic Party of Mississippi gave to the Democrats and so on and so on. It just, un, uh, it, it, propelled the dynamic of the intensely segregationist Democratic Party in the South uh, to become something, uh, something that had to be dealt with. It forced that to happen. And it forced it because people were, uh, at least Bob Moses, was able to conceptualize a nonviolent way of forcing that to happen. Well, why do I tell that story? I, I admit. One reason is because it's in my next book and I wanted to pique your interest in my next book. <laughs> but the real reason is, or the other additional reason, is that, uh, is that it, it strikes me that that power situation, I'm fascinated by power situations, that power situation in the South was, uh, was one that needed a revolution, right? It looked like all the power was being held by the white community, and they were very determined not to give up their privilege and not to share their power with the black community. And the black community needed to have a revolution in order to, uh, to turn that around. And they turned to nonviolence, by and large, in order to pull that off. Uh, so that's the reason I tell that story. Um, it, it strikes me as relevant to today because I think we do have a power elite in our country today that has as little intention of giving up its power as the Mississippi white people had of giving up theirs. And that I think we're going to need to sharpen our strategic minds in order to be able to handle that. 
uh, we're, we're going to need to, not only we were talking up here before, uh, before we started about uh, the need for sustained attention. Wendy, Wendy is leading a, helping to lead a, a grassroots movement that already is three years down the pike. That's one thing we need to learn is how to sustain campaigns that give so much trouble to the power elite that they finally have to yield. Uh, but, but also to figure out strategic approaches where our, our uh, vulnerability and our other strengths and resources can be maximized in gaining leverage against the uh, power elite such that they are forced out. The other thing I'll say is that one reason why I'm so um, excited about this is because we have examples from the Nordic countries, my, my previous book, of countries where there was a power elite running those countries a hundred years ago, just as our power elite, our economic elite runs ours. And they were able to see through, which is always the need, right? It's always transparency that's needed. Sooner or later, we need to see through the rhetoric of democracy, that's what the, the, the Norwegians, the Swedes did. They saw through the rhetoric of democracy and realized those countries were not, in fact, democratic. And then what they did was, even though uh, they had the example next door of Russia having waged a revolution with armed struggle, they figured out that their resources would actually be better used through nonviolent struggle, using non-cooperation in order to force a change. And they did succeed in pushing the economic elite so far out of its traditional dominant position so that they had the political space to actually invent an economic model, what economists call the Nordic model, which actually delivers more freedom than we have in the United States, more freedom than certainly they had had historically, uh, more individual freedom and more collective freedom to determine their own uh, economic future and more democracy to go with it and more economic justice to go with it. So having been, having seen that there, there has been on this planet some examples of social revolution, that is, uh, revolu nonviolent revolutions that have gone far beyond the, uh, the kinds of cases that Erica and Maria report in, in their research and, and so many of us, ha and we have in the Global Nonviolent Action Database that we created at Swarthmore, uh, many of those have been uh, it's significant struggles in the sense of making major changes and yet haven't been able to pull off uh, the degree of change that was pulled off in the Nordic countries. And so what I see, drawing to a close, is our own country having exemplified brilliant strategic work in taking on an elite and being able to give it maximum trouble through, uh, through their own resources and, and also echoing an example from abroad where a similar thing happened. So to me, uh, not to say that it's all done and all we have to do is be copycats, but the fact that so much has been accomplished, utopia not having been achieved anywhere, <laughs> but so much has been accomplished in pursuing revolution in that way that it gives us good reason, I think, to continue to develop that line of strategizing. Thank you. CEO, I'll see you. How you doing? Well, I find myself agreeing in part and disagreeing in part. And um, I'm the one that wrote pacifism as pathology, not pacifism is pathology. Major distinction. Gets lost in the shuffle often. I've been active nonstop my whole adult life. You can pick that up in 68 when I was on the wrong side of colonial war in Vietnam and became active in opposing it on the ground there. I don't tend to count that. So I pick it up at the very end of 1968 and haven't stopped since. 
Now, the activism is taking a range of forms, although it gets more and more concentrated in making articulation than in action. As well, I'm not as old as George here because, say, he was Oxford, Ohio, summer of '64, already active, and I was in high school at that point, and I suppose I was active, but not politically. <laughs> the range of struggle I've engaged in includes armed struggle. I believe in it. I practiced it. But in that entire, headed for 50 years, continuous activism, probably 95% or more of all my political engagement would qualify by anybody's definition as nonviolent, except maybe my own, because I never see political activism in the context of endemic violence as being a non the context is anything but nonviolent. I don't see a purity in picking up the gun. I don't see a purity in refusing the gun. I don't see it as a moral issue. The moral issue is allowing the monstrosity that is the existing, existing order to continue. So, the tactics are adapted to circumstance. The context of North America is different than the context of armed struggles elsewhere, certainly different than it was in Vietnam, where I initially acquired my edge. But it was not my only experience of what they referred to as counterinsurgency warfare. That was a misnomer by the time in 1968 I arrived there, but there had been a period of counterinsurgency pursued by the United States. Counterinsurgency war was waged against the American Indian movement and its supporters on Pine Ridge Reservation, South Dakota, in the United States from 1973-1976, and probably longer than that, but that's the intensive period. That was rather familiar to me. Everything was familiar. And in that context, the rules were these. Defend yourself or die. And that's something akin to the rules that pertain to Mississippi in that period. We need to understand the history correctly to draw lessons from it. Mickey Schwerner was not a young student. Mickey Schwerner was an experienced organizer. He was with CORE, not SNCC. That was Confederated Organizations that summer. Andy Goodman was a student who you probably did encounter if you were in Miami. Cheney was a SNCC field organizer. These things are true, but those were not the only three killed that summer. There were another half dozen whose names you've not heard. In fact, while the FBI and the Navy were conjointly trying to find the bodies of the three, and they were looking for the three because two of them were white, and one, Schwerner's parents, were major Democratic donors in New York. And the search and the intensity of that search was at the directive of Lyndon Johnson because this was screwing up his plan. Well, while they were looking for the bodies, they came with a dismembered torso of a black, young, probably 20-year-old, dumped in the swamp, no head, no arms, no legs, core T-shirt. That didn't make the news. And that needs to be a part of our history. This is the establishment history that's being regurgitated here. The violence continued until it was stopped. And the next year, SNCC's organizing took the form as a prelude. Well, actually, it was already going on. 
but it, it came out publicly the next year, Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which some of you may recognize the name Black Panther Party. That was the original Black Panther Party. That was the locals armed in self-defense, organized by Stokely Carmichael and a cadre of SNCC organizers, okay, where you had something less than 10 percent, considerably less, of the eligible black voters in the entire county, where they were numer numerically equivalent to whites. None of them were registered to vote. Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party came out of that experience was the Klan won't kill you if they know you'll shoot back. It's not the White Citizens Council protecting you. I understand the strategy, and it was indeed Bob Bose's strategy, and it worked for a while, and then it didn't work anymore, as Mississippi Freedom Summer demonstrated, and as the subsequent murder of Vernon Dahmer did. But the Klan are not brave people. Robert Williams had already demonstrated that in North Carolina. They will night ride you, they'll burn crosses, they'll terrorize you, they will kill you as long as you're defenseless. Shoot back, they stop. That doesn't always work. Those tactics are not appropriate to every situation, but I will not ever sign a pledge of nonviolence in a violent context. From position of relative disempowerment, I will never foreclose any tactic that can be of utility, a priori, as a matter of principle. If you find that a part of your spiritual tradition, that's fine. Practice it, but do not impose that or attempt to impose that in people in other contexts, other circumstances, with other historical experiences. That is how we manage to establish the basis of unity. You do not cruise into somebody else's turf and tell them what the conditions are for your support. That is really praxis, as they put it in Marxian circles mine and those that I tend to work with, but I work with people who believe in nonviolence. They come not from a liberal paradigm of understanding, but put their bodies on the line. And I see precious little of that in nonviolent practice today of really putting bodies on the line. You could see that at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That was not cooperating with the cops marching like self-hurting sheep into a free speech pen out of sight and hearing of the people you're supposed to be speaking truth to. No, that was confronting authority head on. Not a tactic that I usually approve, although I participated in that sort of thing as well. But it's direct confrontation where the rubber meets the road and suffering consequences for it not going home and watching yourself, see what the media coverage is in the 6 o'clock news and see if your face appears upon it, which is the praxis that I'm condemning as being pathological, self-delusional, it's self-deceptive, it's a poser kind of praxis, and at best aspires to liberal results, which is reinforcing to the system of oppression that if you're serious in posing, you got to get out of that particular box. That's all I can say. The hegemony of nonviolence is not what any seriously nonviolent, concrete, revolutionary activist would ever impose upon anybody anywhere at any time. Preconditions for my solidarity are oppose the system. How you do it may not be the way I'll do it, but I'll support you in that struggle and I expect reciprocation. Absent of reciprocation, we never had a basis for political act, organizing activity in any case. So, Wado, I thank you for listening. And Matakayasi, which is, we are all related. Oh. My um, remarks are directed to the white people in the room.
Can you hear me now? Now can you hear me? <laughs> yeah? You want this one? I know it works. Okay. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, okay. Go. Good. Um, my remarks are directed to the white people in the room. Now, many of you are on the precipice experiencing dehumanization, degradation, premature death, and soteriological insecurity. Now, your factories have shut down because industrial capital is not your daddy. Your people are overdosing and dying like flies because big pharma is your daddy. Now, you are sliding down, down, down below the glitter and glamour of whiteness. You thought that deal was going to save your ass. But pay close attention. The chimera of whiteness was nothing more than a trick executed by the bloody hands of white capital. To procure free, cheap, and degraded labor, they propped you up with myths of superiority. They created a vortex of violence that undergird your civil society and your American dreams. Your white picket fences were really barbed wire. Your apple pie was poisoned by pesticides and the trauma of slave and near slave labor. Your excessive desire choked the rivers with filth and smothered the air with toxic dirt. But you persisted in your myths. You clung to the apotheosis of your mediocrity, hoarding the wealth created by my ancestors and turning a willfully blind eye to the systematic genocide, state-sanctioned and extra-legal murder, and the maelstrom of quotidian violence. But now they are coming for you. What do you do? Do you cling to your whiteness, to your false and shaky privilege? Or do you lay your body on the line and resist? It is up to you. It is up to you. White supremacy and capitalism were joined from the beginning. Kickstarted by the rape of the African continent, the transportation of some 12 million black bodies, and the genocidal theft of these indigenous lands, Euro-American wealth begins at the nexus of capitalism and white supremacy, violence, and dispossession. The white men who wrote the U.S. Constitution evaded recognition that slavery was foundational to the U.S. politically, economically, and socioculturally. They told lies about white superiority that served as an alibi for the violence of accumulation. Nevertheless, it was enslaved Africans brought in chains that provided the labor that allowed the United States to grow into a capitalist ec economic power. While they were producing cotton, sugar, tobacco, and rice, my ancestors were thoroughly dehumanized. They were chattel, real estate, property. They were bought and sold, yielding profit for slave owners and a host of allied industries, including southern merchants who supplied food and clothing to slave owners, railroad and ship owners who transported slaves, northern banks that handled the exchange of money, and northern insurance companies covering slave owners' investments. The slave trade was the foundation of the entire economy. The entire economy rested on the backs of slaves. The New England textile industry, for example, was fueled by the labor of enslaved blacks picking cotton. Indeed, according to the scholar Garakai Chengu, cotton was to the early 19th century what oil was to the 20th, the commodity that determined the wealth of nations. Cotton amounted to a staggering 50% of U.S. exports and ignited the economic boom that America experienced. America owes its very existence as a first world nation to the degradation of my enslaved ancestors. From the beginning, white supremacy and capital, capitalism depended upon the relation of terror. It was terror and violence that attended the Atlantic slave trade and opened the possibility for the, gener the generation of great white wealth. And it is terror and violence that attends the black incarcerated body of the 21st century. On one hand, in the 15th and 16th centuries, black death fueled the accumulation of capital. On the other end, in the 21st century, black death and warehousing are tools for solving the endemic crisis of overaccumulation. The point is that it is upon the dead and debilitated black body that your white culture, society, and political economy rises. Your lifestyle is enabled by terror, violence, death. Your civil society, with all its hypocrisy and denial, is based upon the death and degradation of my people. 
Ruth Wilson Gilmore, the Marxist geographer, defines racism as the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Black, brown, and indigenous people are under constant attack, legally and extra-legally, and the result is terror, violence, and the looming reality of early death. This is true in terms of police violence, mass criminalization, deportation, and the abject failure to protect. But it is also true everywhere, every day, through the most intimate details of our life. The bodies of black women and black children have no value. A black woman is 22% is 22 percent more likely to die from heart disease than a white woman, 71% more likely to perish from cervical cancer, and 243% more likely than white women to die from pregnancy or childbirth-related causes, 243%. Black babies are two or 300% more likely to die in infancy than white babies. In cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Chicago, there's a 20-year gap in life expectancy between people living in black neighborhoods and those living in wealthier white ones. An entire generation, 20 years. Eric Garner was confronted by police for selling Lucy's. I'm minding my business officer, please just leave, he said. And then the police grabbed him in a chokehold and five others pinned him down on the sidewalk and forced his arm behind his back. I can't breathe, Eric Garner said 11 times, and he died. Three years later, Eric Garner's warrior daughter, Erica Garner, died. She died of heart failure after a severe asthma attack and after three years of waging intense battle seeking justice for her father. Why have no police been convicted or sent to jail for killing black men, she demanded. Why do police departments possess tactical military equipment that make community protest routes resemble war zones? In an interview two days before she died, Eric, Erica Garner said this, my father died on national TV. I had to see him die on national TV. I felt the same pain my father felt on that day when he was screaming, I can't breathe. He was saying he was tired of being harassed, tired of being arrested, his money being stole from him. I'm not giving up, and this is the fight. I'm in this fight forever. We deserve justice. Forever was short, though, because Erica died. Death at the hands of police, death by the weight of oppression and grief. Either way, Erica and her father died prematurely, <coughs> caught in the vortex of terror and violence that completely defines this space called America. I turn to George Jackson author, theorist, and revolutionary who thought and wrote brilliantly about what it means to be human in a world that wants you dead. Jackson was very clear that white supremacist monopoly capital would not be defined away with peaceful protest. The argument that the prestige of power will let itself be educated away is too idiotic to be allowed to stand. Waiting for power to move to its inevitable collapse is suicidal for all concerned, he wrote. Jackson's exploration of the meaning of revolutionary violence centered on exposing the brutality and repression that keep the U.S. intact. To expose the terms the white supremacist monopoly capital rule is predicated on, Jackson believed in the sacrifice of an armed revolutionary vanguard. What he so clearly articulated was that armed revolution or not, we are sacrificed. Born to a premature death, he wrote, a menial subsistence wage worker odd job man, the cleaner, the cot, the man under the hatches without bail. Anyone who can pass a civil service examination today can kill me tomorrow. Anyone who passed a civil service examination yesterday can kill me today with complete Im immunity. I've lived with repression every moment of my life, a repression so formidable that any movement on my part can only bring relief, the respite of a small victory or the release of death. Since I am already a slave, Jackson is arguing, the only redeeming course, the only way possible for us to claim our humanity and simply live is the sacrifice of armed struggle. I am a product of violence, a deep and searing violence that shapes my ontology, the contours of my history, the dimensions of my future. I did not make the violence. The violence made me and it will unmake me. I wept as I quoted George Jackson. I wept 
as I face the dilemma, the truth, that the desire to be black and simply live requires a confrontation with repression and violence that consists of violence and bloody sacrifice. I don't see a way out of this dilemma because I cannot trust you. But this is what I know and what I want to say to you. Being human requires you to recognize that your life depends upon savage brutality and murder. Being human requires that you confront the terror and violence upon which rests the foundation of your white lives. For us to simply live, to express our humanity, and for the possibility of nonviolence, it is ultimately up to you. This is the truth. Revolutionary nonviolence is up to you. Wow, lots of food for thought here. And we have a good 15 minutes for questions. 30 minutes. 30 minutes for questions. So first of all, what's really nice about this is we're able to start off this conference with kind of trying to contextualize that idea of what is revolutionary nonviolence for us. And we have a lot of different ideas and thoughts and perspectives that have been presented here. And something I find really important, especially for today, is the ability to hear other voices and be able to understand them. And a term I came up with, not came up with, I encountered fairly recently is cultural humility. And it's this idea that our own ideas have to kind of settle back a little bit so that we can hear other people and hear other voices. We've heard multiple voices here and perspectives. So take a minute, jot down some questions you might have, and then we'll pass around a mic and we'll get you to ask your questions to our great panel here. Thank you. OK. You, you don't have to jot the questions down, but I do that because with students, a lot of times they have a lot of different ideas, and by you know writing it down, it kind of helps you kind of think of the words that you want. Okay. That one doesn't work. So can I start this off? I want to hear your grandma's story. Because oh stories are really powerful, and I use them in teaching and learning, and I want to hear your story. So that's my question. What is your grandma's story? OK. If I must. Yes. OK, so my grandmother was ahead of her times. She was a Palestinian who um, was a strong feminist. You know, she didn't subscribe to sort of getting married very young and uh, she was her own person she refused to get married and she uh, and uh, until the suitor came she was in her 30s and that was like wow she's an old lady anyhow she defied all the rules and lived like she wanted and um, her husband my grandmother took her to the United States where she had my father so my father was born in Michigan and then she said to him, you know what, I don't like this life, I'm leaving you. And so that was so out of the ordinary back then that a wife would just leave her husband. And so she took the boat back to Palestine. And another thing she did was like, she's like, I don't, I don't know about this Greek Orthodox religion. That's what she was, you know, part of. So I, I don't, I can't relate to it. So she befriended a Quaker teacher who was there for the Quaker, for the Friends School. And... Um, she was convinced of Quakerism. And so, again, against all odds, the single woman saying, bah, you know, I'm changing my ways and, and doing what I want. Uh, and, and she just uh, dropped it and uh, said, I want, to, I want to be a Quaker. And so, you know, she, she was born in 1901. And so that tells you, and she was, she was really, you know, back then women, you know, hardly had an education uh, or had a voice to stay, to, to do what they want, but she defied all odds. And hence our family and I am a third generation Quaker. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to come around, and if folks could say who they are. Rise one as 
I'm Bernadette Muthian. I'm from Cape Town in South Africa, and I'm very privileged to be here. I was fascinated by this opening panel from a Palestinian Quaker from 1901, who could have imagined, to the discussions around don't impose any form of doctrine onto me, whether it be nonviolence or anything else, or eating M&Ms, for example. Um, but I have been, um, being South African and a child activist and against apartheid, um, but we waged um, different forms of arms struggle, even in the streets as a child. So coming from that sort of moment into hanging out with the Quakers a lot and doing a lot of healing and reconciliation in the 90s, and now in this moment where it feels that the nexus between, as you so, uh, spoke so well, Wendy, as well, but the nexus between capital and patriarchy in particular and white supremacy in South Africa as well is so very, very troublesome and imposes such extraordinary femicide on us in my country and elsewhere as well, but it, for us in particular in the country. And then being confronted with this deep dilemma, and for me it's not just a political dilemma, it's an ethical dilemma around nonviolence and the efficacy thereof. And I thought this conference was so, and I was grateful Matt had uh, mani mani machinated for me to get here so efficiently and to, to, to help me um, solve this deep, vexing uh, conundrum I've had for at least the past year around the efficacy of nonviolence and how we are to go forward in perhaps um, <clears throat> a polymorphous way, as Ward Churchill suggests, um, so that there is no hegemony of, of nonviolence in, in our struggles. So I look forward to more wisdoms and so that I can find a way forward as well. Hmm. Well, if I understood the way the question was framed correctly, and I'm not sure that I did, I think I sort of addressed that, that experience is different between communities, even within what's demarcated like South Africa as a country, that's a territorial component created by colonialism. And that has some implications as well. Within that, you've got various indigenous nations, right? In order for them to be identified as South African, the usual model in these constructions is that a predominating group was selected by the colonizer to manipulate, control, administer to the various colonized peoples in these administrative compartments that were created. That, that has continued in the post-colonial, so-called post-colonial context, where you see a continuum of struggle, armed violence, bloodbath in Africa that it began in Katanga, say, with the so-called decolonization of the Congo and in a desperate struggle to retain, quote, territorial integrity of the newly independent state, which called itself the Congo. What is the Congo? Okay. It's a whole cluster 60 plus, is, if I remember correctly, and I won't swear that I do, indigenous nations, self-determining peoples, a history of having managed themselves, governed themselves, provided for themselves since time immemorial. They're now subordinated to a centralized state authority. It's a Western convention that was imported in an epistemological imposition, okay? And that has been responsible for most of the bloodletting in Africa, whether you're wanting to talk about Biafra and the struggle to keep the evils in, contained in a state and various other struggles. The fight back, which was armed struggle in Africa, if there had been somebody that respected the, the history, tradition, circumstance of the internally colonized nations 
that did not consent to being a part of the state struggle would have been alleviated and a lot of the bloodletting wouldn't have occurred. So I'm, what I'm saying is I don't go in, cannot go in with a prescription, a moral standard, if you will, and impose it upon relations of people whose histories and circumstance I don't understand. Take them where they are. And they may very well have strong reason in ongoing history to react in the way George Jackson, thank you for reading that, by the way, defined it here. The circumstances even within states, between groups, communities, peoples, can be radically different. And the point that I think the last speaker on the panel was trying to make was that just because you understand from a position of privilege that the rules are such and so in the United States for the communities of color that were being addressed within that, it can be so fundamentally different that it's unrecognizable to you. Where we are in Pennsylvania, let me take you to Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. You're going to think you're on another planet. And the fact that they're out of sight, out of mind, does not change that one bit. Their response to those circumstances, a town in Pine Ridge with a per capita income now is less than $3,000. And I don't know if any of you have ever spent a winter on a South, a winter in South Dakota on the plains, but you're talking 40 below zero ambient temperature and a 40 mile an hour wind off. And try heating a house, try even having a house on 3,000 bucks a year. The terms of struggle are defined differently, and your response pattern of necessity is going to be defined differently. You acknowledge that. And you can form solidarity. And if you've got something constructive in terms of tactics, strategy, the contribution to make it, it will be accepted. I've heard a lot about Quakers tonight. I had a great aunt died in a Quaker retirement community. I mentioned being a participant in armed, in armed struggle, which was with the Black Hills Alliance which were now out to Pine Ridge, worked with a Quaker organizer by the name of Mick My Nick Meinhardt, and he maintained the principles you're talking about in solidarity without challenging the fact that we were, had seized land and were defending it by force of arms. All right? We respected his practice. He respected ours. That's the only way I can answer your question to resolve the issue. There's only a moral dilemma if you assume that your morality, your personal morality, is applicable to all people all the time. The universalizing condition, which is a Western tradition of defining the world in terms of itself, and you can measure up if you become like us, and they've done everything possible to transform consciousness of everybody on the planet into their own, and then like somebody's good German grandmother, who runs around talking about there's a place for everything and everything in its place, guess what? There's a place for everybody and everybody needs to be staying in their place and we end up with the social order that we occupy right now. No, we got to break out of that. There's not one prescription, not one rule. There's a vast variety of human experiences and we need to be insofar as we're cognitive of the fact we're not all alike, respectful of that in principle and in practice, always. You go in to listen, you don't go in to preach. Had enough missionaries. Hi, um, my name's Sam Menefi Levy. I'm an organizer in Washington, D.C. Um, this question is professor, for Professor Marshall. Um, Please. Please don't call me Professor Marshall. <laughs> I'm, I apologize. Uh, so, um, I, I was reading Blood in My Eye a few months ago. I happened to read it right after I read Jeffrey Nilan's Foucault Beyond Foucault, talking about the, the sort of 
uh, proliferation of technologies of power, um, right, that we are more subjugated than ever by uh, public means, by corporate means, by private self-imposed means, um, and juxtaposing that against uh, Jackson's writings on total disorder. Um, and sometimes it seems that we're so locked in, we're so debt uh, ridden, we're, we're so uh, confined um, that the, even imagining total disorder seems uh, like a, a, a fantasy of, of, of time past. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could talk about what that might look like now. Well, I think that when I say that you meet violence and repression with violence and bloody sacrifice, I mean that. I mean that I think that George Jackson's strategy um, is basically a strategy of sacrifice. In Blood in My Eye, George Jackson says, you know, our job as the vanguard is to um, wake people up. And the more disorder we can create, the, the, the sooner people will see what bullshit this is. Um, but I think that's, that's, uh, that's about sacrifice. Um, especially now, it's about sacrifice, because George Jackson was writing in, you know, a whole different technological era. Um, so, um, and sometimes I think that's absolutely right, that we need a revolutionary vanguard to be a sacrifice, because people are completely um, deluded. And, you know, my point is that it's, it's not so much, I mean, my point is that we live in the middle of violence, so how dare you talk to me about nonviolence, right? My life, our lives are saturated with violence, so the discussion about whether we're violent or nonviolent is sort of not to the point. Oh, good evening, my name is Chris Corthain. I'm from the Universidad de Rosario in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, thank you so much for an excellent opening to the panel. And just to kind of go a little bit off kind of ward talk, um, talking about the kind of the differences in struggle based on the geographical context and just going a little bit to the topic of the, of the conference in terms of 50 years from 1968, I wonder if we might think about also temporal variations. Kind of what do the panelists feel like if there are general tendencies of the terrain of struggle that have shifted over the last 50 years? kind of in a global sense, what do you think those are and how would you characterize kind of where we're at today in terms of struggles kind of as a result of 1968 and the things that, have, that we've been living in terms of neoliberal globalization Thanks. So, uh, since? Thank you very much. Whoever. I want a piece of it, but you can go first. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that... Um, since the onset of neoliberalism and the victory of Ronald Reagan in them, we have lost a lot of um, labor unions are um, have been kneecapped. Um, the Voting Rights Act isn't even recognized as something that's a thing. Um, so I think that there are a lot. I think that a, a whole generation of children grew up in neoliberalism and have no understanding of the kind of struggle that happened in the civil rights movement, in the Black Power movement, in the in the in the anti-Vietnam War movement, in the women's movement. Um, and so I think I think we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to 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 pick it up and get to the place where we need to be. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. I would also say we'd better hurry up because um, we don't really have much more time. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Borgart. I'm from Juniata College. Excuse me. And, um, I was, I was oh. going to provide a little response to that one, too. So well, put well, it well, down. Well, let's see. All right. That's yeah, um, possible. So mine is directed to the entire panel, but also more specifically to what Ms. Marshall was talking about. Um, you, you don't have to call me Ms. Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, Dr. Marshall? No. Oh, you, no. you really shouldn't call me. You can call me Wendy. Wendy was talking about. Um, you all talked a lot about white supremacy and the deep cultural roots of this, specifically in the United States. And I was wondering how you feel that we would best address these conflicts for sustainable solutions and cultural changes to stop the violence and to stop growing up in that violence as you talked about. So, so I, I think it's your job to figure that out. It's not my job. 
I don't, I don't know what to tell you. you. You're not my people, and I don't know how it works. Um, I, I know that I think you all need to get it together and, and figure it out, but I don't, I don't really have any advice for, for how you do that. I'm sorry. Yeah, actually, it doesn't really tie them both together. But in response to the other question, it may shed some light on yours, you know, for whatever it's worth. But she's correct. I'll quote Stokely Carmichael on that when Abby Hoffman, of all people, asked him, you know, what am I supposed to do when they push the white organizers out of SNCC, said, you know, black people need to do this for themselves. And we've had somewhat the same conversations, but this one was recorded and he said, you know, the problem is your community. You need to go goddamn to organize your community. You don't, we don't need you to organize black people. Okay. There's your assignment. It's as valid now as it was in 1966 when it was issued in that particular case. Both of those individuals stayed the course one way or another, and they're both gone now. So you're the coming generation. There it is. There's your marching orders. You know your community. Organize it. But understand, in response to his question, circumstances have also changed in terms of we lost a whole lot of ground. She was pointing out one wing of it in terms of dissipation of unions and so forth, a structure that we could utilize that was pre-existing. We have to kind of rebuild, but maybe not in the same forms, in the process of 